lesson today is aimed toward one individual, and that's me. Because it's something I realize more as I go along that I need to hear this lesson. And especially, I think, the last few days when our brother Fred passed, you know, when these times come, it makes us ponder things more, doesn't it? Think a little differently than we do a lot of times. And the title of our lesson today is Things Left Undone. Many times uh, we're guilty of that, aren't we? Leaving things undone, we procrastinate a lot. Why do we do that? Well, that seems to be just human nature a lot of times, doesn't it? We just say we're going to do something. Well, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. And then what happens? Well, we turn around and they don't get done, do they? You know, it brings to mind James chapter 4, verse 17. He says, To him, therefore, that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know, that rings very, very true, doesn't it? Those who say and know they've got to do good, but yet they don't do it. Well, that becomes sinful many times. And, you know, and much of the world doesn't really look at it that way, though, do they? A Christian does, though. Christians realize uh, we need to be doing good. That's, that's our objective. That's our job as Christians, to go about doing good, to imitate the Lord. That's what he did, didn't it say in Acts chapter 10? He went about doing good. Well, that's our job. We're supposed to imitate him. You know, but the reason we don't, why? Why do we not? Do we not have the same time today that, they had years ago. Do we not still have 24 hours in a day? Well, sure we do. Then why, why is it that we just don't seem to get things accomplished uh, that people used to? Well, I think one big reason is we have a lot of distraction in this country in our day, don't we? I think probably today it'd be a safe thing to say that we have more distraction today than probably ever has been in history. So many things bide for our times. You know, we, we have so many uh, things that just make us commit to them. And then at the end of the day, we, we've finished all our commitments, and then when we turn around, well, I didn't get what I really need to get done today, but I got all these other things done. You know, I remember when I was a teenager growing up, Maybe on a Friday or Saturday night, I, I could think about going somewhere. Times have changed, haven't they? Today, most teenagers think seven days a week, I need to be going somewhere, doing something. You know, that's just the way it is. And it's not just the teenagers, it's just the adults. We need to be on the go all the time, just doing something, going somewhere. You know, and... Uh, being on the go like that, well, that can be very taxing on us, can it? Mentally, physically, but most of all, spiritually, when we are like that. We have so many things in our lives that keep us busy, and then at the end of the day, as we said, uh, did we open our Bible today? Did we look to God's Word and see what He had to say for us? And a lot of times, you know, we're guilty of saying, I didn't have the time today. When I lay my head down in bed to go to sleep, I realize, you know, I didn't open up God's Word today like I should. You know, and those, those are troubling thoughts that we have. I, I did all these things, but yet I didn't give God the time that He deserved in my day. And so that's what we want to Look at just a few points today about things being left undone. Why, why do we do that? Why do we leave things undone? It's a great question to ask ourselves, isn't it? And there's, there's several reasons, various reasons, but I think, number one, we maybe fail to prioritize things correctly, maybe. You know, we, we have a lot of priorities in our life, but what is the most important thing that we need to prioritize in this life, well, thankfully we have the scriptures to tell us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 is a good start, isn't it? 
What's it say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, God tells us what we're to seek first, what we're to prioritize our lives by, and that's him, first and foremost. You know, there's a billboard, I think, in here. Uh, it talks about that. Who do we put first? What's well, God? Then we put our family, and, and, and then we put ourselves third. But is that the norm in our society today? Oh, no, that's really not the way we should do that. For most people, well, it's me. I, I'm first. I've got to look out for myself. I'm supposed to be first in everything. That's the way the world looks at it, isn't it? And what kind of shape is our world in again? Not, not very good, is it? Why is that? Because they're not prioritizing the things that they should, as like God said. You know, Jesus was talking about it in Matthew chapter 6 there. He says, and all these things will be added to you. What, what, what was he talking about there? Well, food, drink, clothing. Do we put a lot of thought into that? Yeah. What, maybe the important thing we're going to think about as soon as we leave services here. What are we going to eat lunch? That's important, isn't it? We need to know what we're going to eat, what we're going to eat. And then maybe, you know, we get a little preoccupied too if we get up on Sunday morning and we go into that closet and it's just lying. I don't have anything to wear. But yet that closet is full. I've got to go buy me something to wear. I don't have anything. Isn't it funny how we get our mind preoccupied on things that the Lord said that he would take care of for us. If we put him first, we wouldn't have to worry about food to eat and what to drink. And if we had clothes on our back, the Lord will supply. You know, and he does. He always has. And he always will, those faithful to him. He always provides us the necessary thing. You know, Jim mentioned it in class, Matthew chapter 22, at verse 37. What is the great and first commandment? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That is the first and great commandment. But how many people do that? You know, it takes a look in the mirror many times to see if we are truly doing that. Do we love the Lord enough to put him first in our life? Priority one. It's a good question we need to ask. You know, maybe another reason is that we just don't see uh, the urgency of some matters, maybe. You know, life is very, very short indeed, isn't it? The older I get, the more I realize that. I'm, I'm going to be 50 this year. That's, that's young to some people. I never thought I'd see the day I would be 50. That's, that's an amazing thought. 20, 30 years ago... That was an old man. Not today, though. <laughs> Times have changed. 50 is not old at all, I'm glad to say. I don't know where it really starts. It might be 60, but I'm thinking it'll be older than that. But, you know, it's just something that we don't see the urgency in things. We just put things off because I've got time. When we're young, we're like that, aren't we? Oh, I've got time to do that. I've got all the time in the world. But then the older we get, the more we realize that time is not on our side. There's an urgency there to get things done. I've heard people say there's not enough hours in the day to get the things done that I need done. I'm, a, I'm understanding that more and more as I grow older. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 9 at verse 4, We must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. He shows urgency right there. We have time while we're living to get things done, but there's going to be a time come. You can't get any work done. Your work will be done, and nothing else will come forth from you after a certain day. You know, the master, he never cut corners. He never tried to avoid uh, stepping on people's toes. He told them what they needed to hear when they needed to hear it, didn't he? Today, we should be the same way. You know, we don't want to be 
rude and crude to people, but we have to tell them the truth. Life is short. And there is an urgency in certain things in life that we need to take care of while we have the time to do that, don't we? You know, James is one of my favorite books in the Bible, and he talks about that in James chapter 4, verse 14. What's he say? What is your life, he says. So he asks that question, and then he describes it. It is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And I've made the point many times before about this fog that rolls into this beautiful valley we live in. And, and many mornings it's just so thick. You wouldn't know there's a sun in the sky many times when you get out and go somewhere, but yet you look up about lunch, there's not a trace of it left. It's the beautiful blue sky. Would never know that the fog was there. And that's just like our life. We're here so full of life for a time, and then we're gone. You know, it's an amazing thing to know how short life is many times when we sit and ponder that. And that makes us realize that we need to put great effort in to doing the things we need to be doing that the Lord expects us to do, spreading the gospel, telling others the good news that there is a Savior. But you need to be urgent about obeying His commands and not put it off. And maybe, too, it could be that we just don't understand the risk many times. As was read for us a few moments ago, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, talks about ten virgins. Five were called wise, five were called foolish. Why were they called foolish? Well, we remember that they had lamps that needed oil, and they didn't take any oil with them. And then uh, all of a sudden at midnight, the cry goes out, the bridegroom is there. <laughs> and so they go and start trying to get somebody to give them some oil, but nobody is going to give it to them. And so they have to go try to buy some, and then by the time they get back, what's happened? The door's closed. They're locked out. You know, that's really, really, you know, today points to so many people today, doesn't it? Oh, well, I, I, I'm going uh, to obey the gospel one day. I'm going to obey it, you know, soon. But yet they fail to take in consideration that the Lord might come at any time. He might surprise us. In fact, he is going to surprise us. Most people, isn't he, when he comes back? That's why the end of that section of Scripture says, Watch, therefore, for do you do not know the hour or the day when he's going to come? <coughs> There's a lot of risk in putting off gospel obedience, then, isn't there? You better believe there is. But so many people do that. So many people just take that risk and, and just don't put much thought into it. But you know we have sobering words in first or Second Thessalonians chapter one at verses seven through nine, where it talks about those people, the fate of those people who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is that? It's described as eternal destruction from the face of Almighty God. That, that's that's sobering. That's scary to think about. It's not just something, it's temporary. It's eternal destruction. Just because people didn't think that it was very much of a risk to not obey God and His gospel. Things that people should think about the seriousness of that so many times they don't. And then some may just on the other hand, don't understand the reward that's involved. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 helps us a little bit with this, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy begat us again unto a living hope by the resurrec resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, unto an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, 
that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. What a comforting thought that is. That we, if we live a faithful life unto the Lord, we have an inheritance that's incorruptible. You know, many people want to inherit a rich aunt or uncle's fortune or something like that. That's money most of the time. But what does money do? Well, it sometimes just don't hold up, does it? Money can be gone very quickly at times. But we have an inheritance that is incorruptible, that never fades away in heaven. What a thought that is, friends. And when you dwell upon that, does that not make you more determined to get that inheritance for yourself? It does me. I think it does for all of us here. We become more determined to get home one day to heaven. That's the point of us being here today, isn't it? That's the point of us living a Christian life is because that's what we want for not only ourselves, but for everyone. Because we know what the alternative is. And it's not something we want to think about. So maybe we could look to and see, well, how can we finish what we start? You know, that's, that's a good question too. And I guess maybe the first thing we need to do there is make a specific list of goals that we want to accomplish as a Christian. And we have to be realistic about it too, you know. I know when we first become Christians, boy, boy we just want to set the world on fire, aren't we? I'm going to go visit somebody every day. I'm going to tell them this, and I'm going to do this and do that. And it doesn't take a long time before that fire kind of cools off a little bit, does it? Well, I, I'm, you know, I, I was going to go see people every day, but... Well, I just, uh, if I can get to somebody once a week. You know, and, and maybe that's a little more realistic. If we would just be thinking about, I can do this this certain day. You know, so many people do that. They have a certain day of the week, maybe Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever it may be, that they do specific things for the Lord, whether it's visit the elderly, whether it's, going to a hospital to see some who are sick in the hospital, whether it's just to do some good deed for someone. You know, and that becomes a habit, doesn't it? And it's a good habit to have. We get in the habit of doing these things, and it just becomes a way of life. Where maybe if it's a Saturday we do that, someone calls your house and says, oh, well, he's not there. I know where he's at. He's out doing what he always does on Saturday. They don't have to wonder where you're at to try to get a hold of you because they know you're doing the Lord's work on that day and there's no point of finding you to go do something else because you've got a job to do. You know, I remember hearing that story about that farmer who, without fail, was it serves us every Sunday well, one Sunday while he's at church services, his cows get out. And his neighbor goes down to his house, and of course he sees he's not home. What does he do? Does he call the police? Well, no, he, he calls the church building. He knows where the man's at. Of course, the farmer takes care of that and says he'll take care of him when he gets home shortly. You know, but he knew where that man was at. He had his priorities set in place, didn't he? Of course. Are we like that? That's the question we can ask. Are we doing things like that? Do we have our priorities right? Do we have a certain time set aside each and every week? What we're doing for the Lord? Or are we letting the world dictate to us what we're going to do? You know, so many people are guilty of that. And I, I'm guilty many times. You know, work and things like that, they put high demands on us, doesn't it? But we have to show 
the world that they are more important things to be considered many times. You know, and I think most of the time we would agree that it's beneficial if we have someone to help us many times do some things, wouldn't it? It's always good to have a helper to do things. Jesus knew that in Mark chapter 6 at verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two. Why did he do that? Well, he knew that it's always better to have a person by your side to help you out. How many times have you been studying with someone? possibly and that person asks you a question that just stumped you well yeah that is a great question and you're sitting there trying to remember where to look in the Bible then you look over at your partner there and they're thumbing through that Bible and I believe I know where we need to go and they come up with a scripture and say, oh, yeah that's it that, great you know if they didn't if they weren't there, well, we would have just stumbled around for a little while trying to find something, an answer for me. You know, sometimes that can throw people off. I'll never forget at the jail one time we were there talking. I was talking to the prisoners there, and I said, you know, the Lord doesn't tempt us over what we can bear, but he always will provide a way of escape. And one of the guys spoke up and said, yeah, that's great. Where is that? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it's, 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 um, that's a good question. And Danny Jones happened to be there that night with us, and he spoke up real quick and said, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I said, thank you. You know, he helped me out, and things just kept rolling right along. But we are human, aren't we? We forget many times. You know, we get questions thrown at us that sometimes we just don't know the answer to, but when someone's with us, they might happen to know it. And it's a great help. The buddy system, as we call it, has great benefits for all of us, doesn't it? You know, we remember the words of the wise man in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 where he said, two are better than one. And then verses 9 through 12, I believe it is, he talks about a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So there's something to that. There's something to having help. There's strength in help. And I think it's noteworthy to mention as well that we have to realize that we have an impact on other people around us, don't we? <coughs> Wherever we go, whatever we do, whether we realize it or not, people are watching us. You know, and it's especially true for children. You know, as parents, we know that those little eyes are watching us, everything we do. Because a lot of times we might say something and then a little while later one of them comes up and says, Hey, yeah, Dad, do you remember you said such and such and we're startled to think well I didn't think they were listening but they were and they do but it's not only children is it it's our neighbors it's our co-workers it's our friends they're always watching us and we have to set forth the appropriate example for them so they will know you know well that that's a that's a real Christian right there I can depend on what he or she tells me because I know they're trying to do right. And that's the greatest compliment anyone can ever give one of us, isn't it? That, that That's a real Christian. That's a true Christian. I remember that one time, and I, I think I've mentioned it here before, but I had a lady do that. I, I helped her on, on the side of the road. It was out of gas, and I went to the house and got her a gallon of gas and said, that'll get you back to Dunlap. She tried to pay me. I said, no, I don't want your money. I said, I said, you can repay me this way. You go to church? She said, well, I need to. I know. I said, well, I'd like to see you Sunday morning. And she just seemed taken aback by that. And, of course, I never seen her. But it's kind of funny how things work out. A couple of months later, I run into someone who had talked to her, and she said, I met a real Christian the other day. He helped me when I was broke down on the side of the road and didn't, he didn't want my money. He just wanted me to come to church with him. And I guess my head swelled a little bit. I, I felt really good. I said, that's the greatest compliment I've ever had and best one I'll ever get. And I hope we all get that at times when we show people what a true Christian is, what a true Christian does for other people. They put other people first. You know, we were talking about that in class this morning. That's what true love is. It puts others 
before our own selves. That's showing Christ living in us, isn't it? Because you remember he went to the cross freely. He wasn't forced to go to the cross. He went on his own accord. Why? Because he loved you and he loved me enough to do that. It's incredible to think about that. You know, Jesus had some important words for us to, to consider in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. He says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? He says, Thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. He says, Ye are the light of the world. That's an amazing statement. We are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under the bushel, but on the stand. And it shineth forth unto all that are in the house. And he says, even so let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What beautiful words that is for us. We are to be that light. Not that sun shining out there so pretty today. That's not the light of the world. Where to be? And we do that by not leaving things undone, don't we? That's how we become that light of the world. We mustn't ever underestimate the power of the power of influence that we possess in this world. We have great influential power, and we have to use it to the best of our abilities. And then someone may ask, how can we finish something if we haven't started it? Well, that's easy. We can't. What's that mean then? That means we need to get started doing whatever it is. Not tomorrow. When you get started today. Did Jesus ever promise us that we were going to have a tomorrow? Never has, has he? But he says you got today. Use it while you've got it. And that's what we're to do. That's what we're to do our very best at. While we have the time, not to be slack, but to be about his business. That's one of those beautiful verses. We remember when Jesus was about 12. Got lost. His parents didn't know where he was at. They go back to find him where he's at. He, he's sitting there at the feet of all these knowledgeable men about God's word. And what did they ask him? They asked, they kind of got on to him a little bit, didn't they? You know, as any parent would. Why, you scared us to death. Where you been? And he said, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Well, that's us. We must be about our father's business every day. But, you know, it's funny how people look at that. You know, they think, well, I, I'll just do it when I get a chance. Uh, you know, who knows when that might be. My dad told me many times, he said, can't, never could do nothing. That's a true statement. But you know what? I'll do it later. Never does get much accomplished either. We've got to be doing it now as much as we possibly can. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 12, verse 35, walk while you have the light that darkness overtake you not. We have to be walking while... We have the ability to do that. You know, and I think all of us understand that very, very well. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, beautiful verses, says, Therefore let us also sing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and hath sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's beautiful verses. You know, he, he explains to us here, the Hebrew writer does, that life is full of weights and sins that hinder us from doing things many times. But we're to look to Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith and press on and, and, and go to work and do things to the best of our ability. You know, many times 
We think, well, you know, we read those stories about the, the talents, the man with the, the ten talents, and the man with the five talents, and the man with the one talent. And a lot of us will think, well, you know, I'm that one talent. Man, I just don't have much talent. Well, you know what? If you know what that one talent is, you can use it to the best of your ability, and God is pleased with you just the same as he is with that ten-talent man, isn't he? But he, calls, he knows everyone's not the same. Everyone doesn't have all these talents. But you've just got to find that one, if that's all it is, and put it to good use. That's what we do. We find what we're good at and make the best of it. That's what God expects of us. You know, that's something we have to get more determined at doing. Putting greater effort into service of the Lord's kingdom. I'm glad to be in a congregation like this that is trying to do good works. Not just here, but all over the world. That's a wonderful thing. You know, Dunlap, Tennessee needs the gospel as much as any place. But, you know, we have the ability to take it in faraway lands, too. Jim's show, that goes all over the world. That's a wonderful thing. And we're just a small part of that, but yet we're a part of it. We're doing our job supporting that. And then I guess maybe the last thing we need to consider are things that we should never leave undone. That's important to realize what we should never leave undone. And I think the first thing we need to know there is we can never stop spreading the gospel. You know, that's something, that is a job that will be needed from now until this world stops turning. When the Lord comes back, the need for the gospel is very, very important. It's, it's very needed today, it seems, more than any other time that we've known in our lives. Why is that, some people wonder? Well, because there's always somebody somewhere who hasn't heard the gospel. I saw a statistic a couple of years ago that said 80%, over 80% of the world, the world now, knows about Coca-Cola. But only 20-something percent have heard the gospel. Is that not tragic? Basically, the whole world knows what Coca-Cola is. But not a fifth, hardly, of the world's population has heard the good news of salvation. That's a tragedy. You know, but whose job is it to get it out into that world and increase that percentage? That's yours and that's mine. And we have to take that job seriously, don't we? We have to be about the Lord's business. You know, Paul proclaimed in Romans chapter 10 at verse 16, they did not all hearken to the glad tidings. Has anything changed? No. They've not all hearkened to the good news today, have they? That's why it's important that we get out and give it to them. And he also talked about in Romans chapter 1, beautiful verses in Romans 14, or 1, verses 14 through 16, where he was a debtor to Greeks and barbarians, to wise and to foolish. And he wasn't ashamed of the gospel because he knew its power. <clears throat> And it is powerful, isn't it? It's not our words that are powerful. It's God's word that is powerful. It's able to cut someone's heart and make them realize that they need him in their life. We have to do a good job at presenting the gospel, but it's all in the power of his word that does the changing of someone's heart, isn't it? You know, there's opportunities all over this community all over this country for the gospel. The question is, are we walking through those doors that the Lord is opening for us when we have them opened? It's a good question to ponder, isn't it? We need to make sure we do walk through those doors when they are open to us and never, ever walk away from them. And, of course, we know to be able to effectively teach others how are we going to do that, we have to study. We have to commit our time each and every day to study of God's Word. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh unto you. How are we going to draw nigh unto Him? Through studying of His Word. That's how we draw nigh unto Him. It takes 
great effort to do that. And as we said, we have a lot of distractions all around us today to keep us from doing that. But we have to be bound and determined, well, I'm going to take this time every day, regardless of who needs me to do what. God comes first. I've got to read his word, study his word, and grow just a little bit today. And I think we all do that. But you know, it gets harder as time goes on in this country. And it probably will get harder to get that time to do that. But we have to be committed to that. It's a daily commitment. You know, and I think another thing we cannot leave undone is just living that faithful Christian life. That's something we have to be committed to. But sadly, there seems to be some people in the world and probably in the church who think that living that Christian life is only really on Sunday. And maybe a little bit on Wednesday night, but mostly Sunday is when I have to really be a Christian and then the rest of the week I can just go back to my old routine doing what I want to do. That's not the way God said to do it, is it? It's an everyday, 24-7 commitment that we live that Christian life before the world. How are we going to influence people for Christ if we come to church on Sunday morning and then we go back down to the old local dive on Monday evening? We can't do things like that, can we, and influence people for good? We have to be faithful every day. You know, that's something uh, that the devil, he smiles at our old adversary, he just loves it when we have attitudes like that. Well, Sunday morning, that's the important day. The rest of them ain't really important to show who I am as a Christian. He knows he's got you on the broad way to destruction when we do that. And he loves it. You know, and I don't want him loving anything I do. You know, you remember James chapter 4 said, Draw nigh unto God. The verse before that says... Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Well, that's what we need to be doing every day, isn't it? Resisting him so that he just run away. Realize he ain't going to do no good with us today. He'll just have to come back another time and try again. And he will. There's no doubt about that. He comes every day. But we can resist him nonetheless. And some beautiful verses that was read yesterday... At Fred's funeral, Revelation chapter 14 at verse 13. The voice from heaven states, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. What a wonderful thought that is, that there is sweet rest waiting on those faithful Christians. You know, that, that's just so comforting for us to know. That when we do lose a faithful Christian, we, we're grieved. But we have to have a smile on our face because we know they've gone on to a better place. They have a better home than we do today. And that's a wonderful thing to know. Psalms 116 at verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of Jehovah is the death of his saints. Some people in the world just cannot comprehend that whatsoever. How can it be precious when somebody dies? Well, you better become a Christian so you can understand it. That's all I can tell you. Because that's the only way to understand it, when you're a child of God and can understand things like that. But you know, that's something we, we know our friend Paul understood very, very well. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. He said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He understood it'd be better for him if he went on to be with the Lord. But to live here was showing Christ living in him. And who got benefits from that? It wasn't just him. It was everybody he come in contact with. They benefited. The world benefited. We benefited from Paul and his example and what he went through. And that's something great to know. And then I think the most important thing that we can never leave undone, of course, is our soul salvation. You know, man has no more important need in his life, bar none, than his soul salvation. But what does man do? Man, well, he seeks after wealth, fame many times, 
and so many other physical things in this life, but yet he leaves the most needful thing undone. Why is that? Well, the world, you know, it doesn't want you to be concerned about your soul. It wants you to just live the life you want to live. But then we have to understand, just like those five foolish virgins that were talked about, there's consequences to be paid in the end for neglect, for things being undone. The Hebrew writer quotes the psalmist in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Wherefore, even as the Holy Spirit saith today, if ye shall hear his voice, harden not, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. You know, he says today we need to hear his voice. Not tomorrow. Today. Sounds like there's some urgency there again. You know, that's something that we've all heard the stories about someone who during the invitation song stood up and tears well up in their eyes. They're, they're holding on to that pew with a very hard grip knowing they need to go forward but yet something just just holds them back. I'll do it. I'll, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'll do it next week. And then we hear those stories about next week doesn't come. During the week they're killed in a car accident. Something like that. They never get another opportunity. Devastating to hear things like that because they knew what they needed to do, but yet they left their soul salvation undone. So sad, so tragic. Something we never, ever want to hear here. But you know, it does happen. People think they're going to get a second chance. Well, you know, that's part of this life, isn't it? We get second chances many times. And that's wonderful. We're glad we get second chances sometimes. But friend, make no mistake about it. When you come upon eternity, sure, second chances are over. You need to make the most of your opportunity today right now while you can because you may not get that second chance you may not get that opportunity that's why we beg and plead every time we come together not to leave this building in a lost state it's too important your soul is the most precious possession that you have then why would we not take its salvation seriously if it's that precious Mind-boggling, yes. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, For he saith, In an acceptable time I hearken unto thee, and in a day of salvation did I succor thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Friends, he is showing the urgency right there not to leave that undone. Now is the day of salvation. Friend, do you realize the state of your soul? Are you a Christian today? Or are you not a Christian? You can answer that. If you're not a Christian, friend, you've left things undone for too long. You need to think seriously about becoming a Christian even today. Do you believe that Jesus is who he gave proof of being the Son of Almighty God through many, many proofs. Would you be willing to repent of your sins to start a new way of life in a new direction? Would you be willing to confess His name before men? And would you gladly enter the waters of baptism to have your sins washed away where the Lord applies the blood of Christ to your soul and cleanses it from all sins. If you do that, friend, and, and you go on and dedicate your life to faithful service to Him, friend, you have what we talked about a few moments ago. You have that inheritance promised you, that home in heaven waiting for you. Or maybe you've done that. Maybe you have been a faithful Christian at one time, but you've let the world 
get to you and, and you've left the world of faithfulness to the Lord and just been undone again. You can make things right by repenting of those things, confessing your faults, asking the Lord to forgive you. He's promised he would do so, and he is faithful who promised. We can always count on him. When he gives us his word, you can count on it. He will make things good again for you. Or possibly you just need prayers to help you along the way to be strong, to be a better Christian. That's why we're here. We want to help each other because we love each other. We want to do just like the Lord and help others along the way to get home. That's the reason we're here, friend. Do you have that need? That's what we ask for you to ponder. Don't leave this building with your soul undone. If you have a need, please come right now while we stand and while we sing.